Give us, we're going to love on God. Father, we love you. And we just, we are so excited to be in your presence this morning. God, you are so good. You are so good. So God, we come to love on you and we know that you are going to love on us. We thank you that your presence is already in this place. You are inhabiting our places this morning, God. So as you love on us, as you hold us close, as you wrap us up in your arms, God, we are going to squeeze you and hold on to you as tight as we can. Uh, everybody said, Amen. Amen. Sing your name in the dark and change 
is everything. We sing with all we are and claim your victory. Let it rise. Let praise arise. We'll see you break down every wall. Watch the giants fall. You cannot survive when we praise you. The God of breakthroughs on our side, forever lifted high. With all creation cry, God, we praise you. Oh, we praise you. Oh, the faith is song that overcomes rage and The faith is song that. We praise you. We 
sing it out.
was a wretch I remember who I was I was marched down this planet I was running out of time See, separated The bridge was far too high From the far side of the castle You had me in the sun So you Made a way across the great divide. If he had him thrown to build it here inside, and then at the cross he paid the debt I owe. Throw my chains, free my soul for the first time I had born.
we give you glory this morning because you are worthy. You're worthy, Lord. We thank you, Lord, that your healing presence is available yes. to us every moment of every day. We worship you for that. You are the healer. You are the Savior. Yes. This morning as we were taking the communion, there were gifts of healing that arrived here. Yes. They just showed up because yes. of your faith yes. and what you were believing in the covenant yes. of communion. But there were some of you who were not ready to receive for the number one reason that people don't receive healing, and that's because they felt like they weren't worthy. Right. But this song, the blood of Jesus is establishing in your heart that you can be totally cleansed yes. of sin. Yes. That you can be righteous before him and worthy to receive everything that he has for you. It's just a matter of faith. What does that faith look like? That faith looks like you seeing yourself standing in the presence of the Lord and his glory coming upon yeah. And your sins are just washed away. And his healing virtue comes. When you see it, when you believe it, that's when it's going to happen. It's here this morning. Amen. Just receive it.
already doing a work in people's bodies this morning. As Sister Pat said, He's more than enough. He's more than enough. Say that with me. He's more than enough. He's more than enough to heal my body. He's more than enough to heal my body. He's more than enough. He doesn't stop that a little bit. He pours out more than you and I could ever think or imagine. Because he's more than enough. Come on, Josh. He's more than enough. Come on, sing that. He's more than enough. He's more. You see, there's no mountain high enough, and he can't take you through, because he's more than enough. There may be water standing in your way, but he will part that water. You will walk through on dry ground, because he's more than enough. no judgment, but only love and love unconditional. Pour it out. Pour it out. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. This morning, we get an opportunity 
to give into God's kingdom. And this morning, you know, we can stand here on this hill and we can see a field of corn. And in the beginning of Genesis, God said that there will always be seed time and harvest. And when we bring what God has given us the ability to, to earn, when we bring that into his storehouse, the planet into his storehouse, his kingdom, he multiplies that exponential. Like I said, I'm standing out here looking at that field of corn. And on that corn, there's at least two ears of corn on that stalk. On each stalk, there's, I believe it was 668 kernels of corn. That's 668 pieces of seed on that corn. And I'm standing here looking at that field of corn. Please stand up and look at that field of corn. I want you to see this. You see how big that field is? How big yes. there is so much corn in that field? I can't even imagine or multiply what is out there. Amen. Amen. That is just a picture of God's goodness and yes. grace yes. and yes. mercy yes. and what he will do in your life. Yes. When you plant a seed into the kingdom of God, he will multiply that seed oh, back to you. Yes. Because he said in Genesis that there would be seed time and harvest. I'm so encouraged by that because not only do I, Sister Pat, I don't even have to use my thing because I can see that corn out there. God proves what he says with creation. Amen? Yeah. For you and I. So this morning as you give, we always have four ways to give. And you can text the gift and that number is 810 202-0605. You can also get to our website at revivalcentercadillac.org. You can also mail it, and that's P.O. Box 667, Cadillac, Michigan, 49601. And then our handsome ushers up here this morning, standing with these uh, baskets. You can place your offering in those, amen? But let me pray over as you give. Father God, I thank you, Lord. Lord, that we can stand here on this earth, Lord, and we can see your promises, Lord, what you said in your word, Lord, that there would be seed time and harvest. Yes. So, Father God, I thank you, Lord, for each and every one of these people today, Lord, that give it to your kingdom, Lord, Lord, that you have already prepared the harvest, Lord, for them. More than thank they can you, think or yes. imagine yes. or can see, yes. Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Lord, but you are the God of increase. You are the God of harvest, Lord. And, Lord, I thank you, Lord, that your people have a harvest in their lives. In Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. Well, I have a few announcements for you this morning. Everybody say September 18th. September 18th. That's when we're going to have our Back to Church Sunday. Amen. Amen. I'll just give you a little quick update on, on the building and J.C. Penney's. We are in the process of doing the build-out, and uh, this week we have made tremendous uh, strides in it. Uh, we got walls up, and we got some uh, shiplap on the walls and stuff. But you know what? We still need help. We still have a lot to do. So this coming week, um, if you would like to uh, help out with us and everything, uh, if my beautiful wife Michelle would stand up. <laughs> you can see my wife, and you can give her your information so we can contact you. We will be putting it out on the Facebook page and our, our website. Um, I can tell you one of the things we're going to need this week is that we need to start preparing some walls for painting. And uh, if you've ever been in the old J.C. Penney building, it used to be uh, racks and stuff on the wall that they sat their merchandise off. But when we pull those out, there's a lot of holes that need to be uh, putty. And then after they're putty, it's a quick sanding and stuff so we can start preparing for uh, later this week, uh, start doing some painting and stuff. Um, and there's still a little bit of cleanup left to do. So if you want to put your hands to that, uh, like I said, see my wife, Michelle, and then we'll also put on our Facebook and website um, uh, time to be there and stuff. Uh, 
And so we can continue to uh, advance in that. Amen? Amen. All right. Well, praise God. That's the only announcements I have. Would you please give a big hand for Pastor Will? see you today, and uh, glad that you are here in this place. It's a beautiful day to be in the tent, isn't it? Yes. And uh, I am so thankful for that. I also know that colder weather is coming. No. And, uh, yes, it is. <laughs> and uh, so I'm also glad that we are getting ready to uh, move to our next spot at the uh, J.C. Penney building, the former J.C. Penney building, and a lot of work has been done over there. We encourage you to stop by and check it out. And also uh, maybe, um, you know, bring your stuff for doing some painting during the day. And then in the evening, some more work is going to be done on the construction end. So we encourage you to be a part of that. We're glad that you can be a part of that. Amen. And uh, we're thankful for God's goodness and grace. Amen? Amen. Amen? So I have a question for you. Are you ready for it? What is the first Bible verse you ever learned? Just raise your hand, I'll call on somebody. John 3.16. Somebody else? John 3.16. What? Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Anybody else? Genesis 1, 1. Yes. Romans 3.23. Romans 3.23. My favorite, Acts 10.38. That's your favorite, not your first. All right, okay. Took a little while to get to that, but you got there, didn't you? Well, I can say that um, the first Bible verse that most people ever learned was John 3.16. That's just kind of a common one. It's, it's one, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. You want to say it with me? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Uh, John 3.16 is, uh, I would say, probably the most popular uh, Bible verse. And uh, it's, uh, it's interesting when um, I was, uh, you know, just kind of moving into adulthood, there was this guy named Roland Stewart. They called him Rock and Rollin'. How many of you have ever heard of Rock and Rollin'? Probably didn't hear of him, but you probably saw him. Because back in that day was when a lot of them, um, you know, sporting events were being televised, and Rock and Rollin' would wear a, a multicolored rainbow afro wig, okay, and he would stand in the end zone or stand where he knew at some point in time the game was going to come to him, and he would hold it up, and it would say, John 316. Right. And uh, he, he would do that, and, and let me tell you something, he not only did that, there was a a whole bunch of other folks that began to do that. They'd show up at sporting events, and they and it would be a sign that said John 3.16. How many of you have ever seen that on any sporting event on TV? You've seen John 3.16. Well, that was a common thing, and uh, Roland Stewart was kind of the first one that understood how that went. Now, in 2009, in the BCS championship game, Tim Tebow, a little more modern time, Tim Tebow in 2009, he, he had under his eyes, he had an eye black, it said John 3.16. Now let me tell you how important that was in that moment. There were 90 million people that Googled John 3.16 during the course of that game. 90 million people that Googled that during that time. It was an incredible thing. But uh, most recently, um, you know, one of of his uh, former teammates, uh, Aaron Hernandez, was found in his jail cell. Aaron had got himself in some terrible trouble, and he was one of Tim Tebow's former um, teammates. He played for the uh, New England Patriots, and um, he was found in his jail cell having committed suicide, but he had written on his forehead in red ink, John 3.16. I believe the world is saying today, 
show me the love. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. I believe that God is, I believe that there's a generation in this hour. It's a generation that has worshipped other gods, followed other paths, and found dead ends at every turn. A generation that has been wasted, worn out, and used up by the gods of this world. A generation that will respond to authentic Christianity whenever they see it. But they have to see it. And they have to know it exists. The need today is for authentic Christians with missionary zeal who will walk the walk and talk the talk and do what God has called them to do. The question is, where are they? Where are they? Because the world is looking for people who have that relationship with God that they're willing to pass on to other people. They're willing to share their life and their love of God with other people. Today, I want to talk to you about two guys who had missionary zeal. And uh, they were reluctant Jonah and fired up Philip. Can you look at the person next to you and say, reluctant Jonah and fired up Philip? Which one are you? Which one are you? Are you reluctant Jonah or fired up Philip? Let's start with Jonah. In Jonah chapter 1 and verse 1, it says, Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry out against it, for their wickedness has come up against me. Nineveh was at that time the most powerful city in the world. It was the capital of the Assyrian Empire, whose military threatened to overrun Israel and its neighbors. The people of Nineveh were known for their fierce brutality in war. Jonah, on the other hand, was fiercely loyal to his home nation of Israel. Jonah would have been stunned by God's command to go to Nineveh and preach to it. It would almost be like today, God speaking to you and saying, I want you to go and I want you to preach to Putin. I want you to share with him and ask for that nation and the people he leads to repent. Or I want you to go to the Ayatollah. And, and I want you to preach to the Ayatollah. It was that kind of thing because they were enemies. The people of Nineveh were known for their fierce brutality in war. They not only would kill their opponents, but they would dismember them. It was a normal thing for them to do that kind of thing in war. Jonah, on the other hand, was fiercely loyal to Israel. And Jonah would have been stunned by that command, but his mission was simple. Go to Nineveh and preach. Now here's the thing. He was told, go ahead and preach hellfire and brimstone. <laughs> you thought he'd have liked that. Preach hellfire and brimstone. Preach eminent destruction. Preach judgment is coming. Jonah, God wanted Jonah to be the first street corner gloom and doom preacher. You know, you've seen them. And you've seen video of them. The guy standing on the corner saying... The, you know, the earth is about to end. The world is coming to destruction. There is nothing left in this world. And you better repent now. Well, Jonah was going to be that first one. And Jonah hated the Ninevites. And so you might say, well, why not just go and preach that kind of message to them? Well, the big problem was this. Jonah knew God. And he knew his God was God of grace. That was the problem. If I go and preach to these people, God wouldn't have sent me if they weren't going to repent. And I don't want them to repent because I want them to be wiped out. God knew that, that or Jonah knew that, that, that God was trying to give them an opportunity to change things. God was reaching out in mercy to the greatest enemy of his people. God was sending a patriotic Jewish prophet to save the enemy of his people. God was asking him to do the unthinkable, the unconscionable, but that was the mission, and he was the missionary. So the question is, what would Jonah do? Now, now everybody has heard the story of Jonah. In fact, the truth is, is that whether people go to church or not, they have heard about Jonah. They've heard about Jonah and the great fish. So Jonah decides, I'm not going to go where God has sent me to go. God has told me to go to the east, and so I'm going to go as far west as I possibly can. So Jonah rose, he, he went to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord, and he went down to Joppa, 
found a, a ship going to Tarshish, so he paid the fare, went down in, into it to go with them to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He did it in deliberate contradiction to the charge to go east to Nineveh. Jonah tried to go as far west as he could possibly go, and he sailed for, for Tarshish, a town on the western rim of the then known world. He did the very opposite of what God wanted him to do. How many of you have ever done the opposite of what God said? Yeah. I think all of us have at some point in time. Yeah, yeah. So why did he run? Why did he? Why did he do it? I believe it's because he put the national interest of Israel over obedience to God, and he put he put he put his interest over the salvation of the lost. He felt morally superior to the wicked pagan Ninevites. And if there's an issue that I can see among the church today, it's this understanding or this thought that in some way, shape, or form, we are in some way, shape, or form superior to some of the people in this world that we would call pagan. It's a problem. Sometimes Christians come across as arrogant. He didn't love these people enough to want to see them saved. Jonah 1.4 says, But the Lord sent out a great wind on the sea, and there was a mighty tempest on the sea, so that the ship was about to be broken up. The storm was so violent that the sailors began to believe that it had a supernatural origin, so they cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. In Proverbs 16.33, there's this verse, The lot is cast into the lap, but its every decision is from the Lord. The Lord was making the decision. The men were exceedingly afraid, it says. And so they said to him, why have you done this? And, and, and they, they decided, well, you know, maybe we need to get rid of Jonah. And Jonah agreed. And so he said to them, pick me up, throw me into the sea, and then the sea will become calm for you, for I know that this great tempest is because of me. And so afraid for their lives, the sailors did what Jonah asked. You see, even in outright rebellion, though, God was merciful to Jonah. Sometimes we don't understand that, but God's mercy is God's mercy, even in outright rebellion. And God's grace is God's grace. Jonah 1.17 says, Now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. I remember hearing a story of a lady who got on an airplane one time, and she was sitting next to this guy, and she was reading her Bible. And as she was reading her Bible, he says, Do you really believe all that stuff? And she said, I certainly do believe all that stuff. And he said, well, what about that story about that guy named Jonah who was swallowed by a great big fish? Do you really believe that Jonah was swallowed by a fish? And, and she said, I, I really do believe that. And, and he said, so, so you, you believe in heaven? She said, yeah. And he said, so when you get to heaven, uh, are you going to talk to Jonah? And she said, I am going to talk to Jonah. And she said, he said, do you really believe Jonah was swallowed by a great big fish? He said, what if Jonah isn't in heaven? And what if there isn't a heaven? And she says, then you can ask him from where you're going to be. <laughs> the fish was God's provision for Jonah and gave Jonah a chance to recover and repent. He spent three days being digested in the belly of a fish. Inside the fish, Jonah offered up a prayer to God, and it's amazing to me what it takes to get some people to pray. But he prayed in there, and in the fish's belly, Jonah was hit by a truth that he had never thought of before. It hit him like a thunderbolt, and that is this. Grace belonged to the Ninevites as much as it belonged to the Israelites. It wasn't like they had some superior right to grace. Why? Because grace is grace. It just is. And it's God's grace, not our grace. It's God's grace bestowed upon us. Salvation comes only from the Lord. It doesn't belong to any race or any class of people. It doesn't belong to them. It belongs as much to the prodigal as it does to the self-righteous elder brother. It doesn't come from any quality or merit in us at all. Grace comes from God. Jonah had been called to go and preach grace to the greatest city in the world, but he hadn't understood that grace was needed for himself. You see, sometimes the longer you've been serving the Lord, the less you think you need grace. I'm already saying, I don't have to go. I don't have to ask. I don't have to depend on God's grace. Well, let me tell you something. 
We depend on God's grace every single moment of every single day. And when you've been through a few things in life, instead of getting a little bit harder about this thing called grace, it needs to soften us up just a little bit and help us to understand that it's God's grace that carries us every moment of every day through every situation that we will ever come across in our life. It's God's grace, not our goodness. Battered and humbled, he began to realize that truth. And at that point, the fish vomited him out. Because of the grace of God, Jonah the prophet had another chance. So it says in chapter 3, Jonah rose, he went to Nineveh, according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, a three-day journey in extent. And Jonah began to enter the city on the first day's walk. Then he cried out and said, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. So the people of Nineveh believed God, proclaimed the fast, put on sackcloth from the greatest to the least of them. And here's the thing. One day of preaching caused 120,000 people who the Bible said didn't know their right hand from their left hand to be saved. 120,000 people. No sound system, no cell phone, no video, no internet, no Facebook or Twitter. This was the supernatural power of God in operation. I can't help but wonder what God will do through us when we obey Him. You see, the truth of the matter is, is that many found themselves being reluctant Jonas. Sometimes we don't really want to share the gospel with everybody. I remember when I worked in the forging company, there was a guy named Rick Durham. And I can tell you this over the course of time. Rick Durham caused me no end of trouble. It was just one thing after another thing after another. How, have you ever worked with somebody that caused you a bunch of trouble? That was Rick. It seemed like no matter where I went, there was Rick. And, and the thing about it is, is my job required that I come in contact with him. It just required it. It wasn't like I could avoid him. It was going to happen. And here's the thing. When I did come in contact with him, I was going to be setting the rates by which he would get paid. How many of you know Rick didn't like that at all? And I didn't like it either because I knew that every time I set a rate, there was going to be some kind of a grievance that was going to be written. And we were going to have to go through a whole process to determine whether I had done the right thing or not. It was a pain. I remember one day the Lord speaking to my heart and he said, So... You want to see Rick Durham get saved? Have <laughs> 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 you, you ever said, have you ever said you knew somebody wasn't a Christian, they, they, they weren't serving Christ? Have you ever said, have you ever said they'd make a great Christian? You ever said that? Mm -hmm. I didn't say that about Rick. <laughs> no, 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 no. Oh, no, no, no. I can't even imagine Rick being on the other side of the equation. But God could imagine it. Yeah. You see, God works His grace in our lives. And he gives the same grace to the person we don't think is worthy as he does to the people we think are worthy. Yeah. God's grace. I don't know about you, but I don't like it when God asks me questions. Because <laughs> he never asks questions because he needs information. He asks questions because he wants me to search my heart. Find out where I'm at. And what needs to happen next. I finally did share with Rick. He knew I was a Christian anyway. I would love to say that Rick came to faith in Christ. I think maybe someday he did, but he didn't then. But I can say this much. After I shared with him, I know it's going to sound odd, but he got softer in his heart toward me than he had been. And life got simpler at that drop of forge after that. So... <clears throat> may not be that big or quick or this spectacular, but you can count on this. 
when you begin to share faith in Christ with somebody who, especially those that you don't want to share with. Let me stop for just a second and say this. There are some people that you've already decided in your life probably are never going to go to church so you've decided not to share the gospel with them because you decided they weren't going to ever go to church. You don't have the right to decide who hears the gospel. You may think you do, but you don't have the right to make that decision. That decision is not yours. Jonah found that out. And I don't want to be a reluctant Jonah. You see, you and I are Jonah many times. There are people that we have not shared the gospel with because we couldn't see them as saved. So let's talk about fired up Philip for just a minute. His story is recorded in the book of Acts. Some of you said, I'm fired up Philip. Well, while Jonah ran from his mission, Philip ran to his mission. Acts 8, beginning in verse 4, says, For Saul, he had made, as, a, as for Saul, he had made havoc of the church, entering every house, dragging off men and women, committing them to prison. Therefore, those who were scattered went everywhere preaching the word. Isn't that an incredible thing? That rather than Saul being able to destroy what God was doing in the church, in order, in, 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 he wasn't able to destroy it. Instead, what happened is people spread everywhere preaching the word. I've had a number of people say to me, you know, there is, there is a lot of trouble that is coming into our world and in our nation. And, and there's a lot of concern and a lot of fear. Let me tell you this much. When trouble comes against the church of Jesus Christ, many times it scatters them. But when it scatters them, it is like scattering seed everywhere. And when they're scattered everywhere, many times they are far more effective at actually being those who propagate the gospel than they are when it's comfortable and warm and in the safe place that they have been. Somebody said, that's true, Pastor. Saul was dragging them off to prison. Therefore, those who were scattered went everywhere preaching the word. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ to them. Now, Philip was a deacon, and uh, he was not a person that was one of the twelve. He was, he was a, a deacon. He was one of the seven who had been called to be deacons in that, in that early New Testament church. And it says, And the multitudes with one accord heeded the things spoken by Philip, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. That tells me that when you are called by God and filled with the Spirit of God, there are signs, wonders, and miracles that are possible wherever you go. Wherever you go, because you carry Jesus in you and the Holy Spirit empowering you. You and the multitudes with one accord heeded the things that he spoke. For unclean spirits crying out with a loud voice came out of many who were possessed, and many who were paralyzed and lame were healed. And there was great joy in that city. Now, he was a deacon. He was not an ordained preacher. He was not one of the twelve. He was one of those who had been chosen because he was full of the Holy Ghost Amen. and power. Yes. And when you are full of the Holy Ghost and power, great things are possible in and through your life. And so when trouble came his way to cause him to retreat, Philip did the unexpected. The enemy never expected him to do what he did. But Philip said, you know what? If the devil is going to come against me, I'm not going to retreat. I'm going to go forward in the name of Jesus. And so he began to share his faith. This is the first time that we have recorded that Philip shared his faith with anybody. But I can tell you this much. When the enemy tried to shut him up, Philip opened his mouth and began to proclaim the word of God. And the minute he became, proclaimed the word of God, I can tell you this much. God began to back it up. Right. Yes, he did. God backs up his word. Somebody said, well, I can see all that happening in a church building, but that's not where it happened with Philip. It happened on the streets of Samaria. That's where it happened with him. Three observations. First of all, spirit-filled believers move forward when others fall back. Secondly, when Philip shared Jesus, the Holy Spirit backed him up. Third, the end result of the gospel preached is joy in the city. 
And one more observation just for extra measure. The gospel is be shared with many or with one. See, Philip came and he preached and it was great joy in the city. And you know what happened after that? you got to get this. What happened after that is the Holy Spirit impresses him to go to one guy out in the middle of the desert. So he starts running. He catches up with the Ethiopian eunuch's chariot. This is the guy heading back for Ethiopia. And he is a big shot in Ethiopia. He is, he is the one that works as close as possible with the queen. Now, here's the thing. He, he goes and he finds that guy reading the book of Isaiah. He runs alongside him and he says, Do you have a clue what you're reading? <laughs> you know what you're reading! The guy's got the scroll out like this. He doesn't have anything. You know what you're reading! And he's like going, uh, no, nobody's ever taught me anything. He says, well, I'll teach you! And he shares with him everything that needed to be shared with him. And he talks about Jesus. And that day, the Ethiopian eunuch, he stops along the way and he says, is there anything here? He says, there's a mud puddle here. Is there anything to hear that prevents me from being baptized? That day, an Ethiopian eunuch came to faith in Christ. Amen. I can tell you this much. There is direct evidence that that was the first time that the gospel then went from there into Ethiopia. And Ethiopia was one of the first nations that became a Christian nation. You think to yourself, wow, that's amazing. Yeah. So what, what did he do now? He went to Caesarea. And he keeps preaching. And he keeps preaching. And he keeps preaching. You know why? Because once you get addicted to winning people to Christ, you can't stop. That's the truth. Thank you, Lord. That's the truth. Most of us will relate to one or the other of these two. Reluctant Jonah or fired up Philip. Did God use reluctant Jonah? Yes, he did. Yes, he did. A number of years ago, a guy uh, came to me and he said, uh, I just want to tell you something that happened. He said, because we've been praying very strongly for my oldest son and we weren't seeing a lot of results. And uh, he said, I want to tell you something that happened. I said, well, what was that? He said, well, he said, I want you to know that me and your son were smoking weed and getting high and talking about the end times. He said, your son knows a lot of Bible. Did you know that? I said, yeah, he knows a lot more than he practices. <laughs> he said, he knows a lot. Then he looked at me and he said, I want you to know, he said, we got to talking, he said, I got so scared of what might happen if I wasn't following Jesus when the rapture took place. He said, I went back to my home church, I talked to my pastor, I repented of my sins. He said, I'm following Jesus as my Lord and Savior. <laughs> Even reluctant Jonas win people to Christ. Amen? Amen? Did God use a reluctant Jonah? Yes. Did God use a fired up Philip? Yes. Why is that? It's because for God so loved the world that he what? He gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That's my Lord. That's why he did it. That's why he did it. I want everybody to stand, if you will. Now, if you will, I want you to sit down. I want you to sit down. I want you to sit down. Gina, I want you to sit down. Hope, I want you to sit down. Okay? And Ethan, I want you to sit down. I'm going to tell you something that may be shocking to some and just regular knowledge to others. 
If there are a hundred people in this room right now, only six of them on average in the United States will have ever won somebody to Christ if they're a Christian. Only six. If you look around at the one city, those would be the ones, theoretically, that have won a person to Christ. The rest of us standing would say, never has happened yet. Never has took place in my life. Never been used by God to do that. I can tell you this much. God is calling reluctant Jonas. He's calling up fired up Phillips. Yes, thank you, Lord. To share their faith. Yeah. Well, what if it's rejected? Do you really think that everyone that listened to the message Philip preached actually repented? I mean, how long does it take you to repent some days? Or months? How long? Some days it takes a while, doesn't it? It's not the first time we hear a message that it's received. See, some folks say, well, if I, if I invite somebody to Christ or if I invite them to the church, what if they say no? Get in a not to, I, I was really kind of surprised because I would have thought today, especially people would be resistant that, in, in a recent survey, it was, it was almost 84, 85% of the people who said that if they were invited to church, they would go. I'm talking about just regular folks. They would come. Sometimes you have to invite more than once, but they said they would go. Those of you who are sitting can stand. I don't want you to become self-righteous. <laughs> can stand. <laughs> I want to ask Pastor Jamie and Pastor Scott to come. Our response to the word today is, is going to be this. On September 18th, we are going to be having what we call Friends and Family Day. It will be our first Sunday in our new location at the former J.C. Penney building. And these here our invitation cards. You're invited to Friends and Family Day. Come see our new location. On the other side, it just gives the date and time. Now, here's the thing. I want you right now to take a minute with your eyes closed to think of several people you could give these to. But here's, here's, here's the condition. I don't want you to give them to anybody who regularly attends church already. It's not our desire to reach the found. It's our desire to reach the lost. Amen. Amen. So I want you, if you will, and especially that relative who you've already decided will never go to church. Because in just a few minutes, I'm going to ask you to respond after you've thought of some names. And I want you to take enough of these that you'll be able to enough of them. Now here's the other thing. Those of you who are savvy on social media and Facebook, I want you to we, we've got it on our, our Facebook page. I want you to, to, to like and share. I want you to put it out on your stuff. You can even take a picture and put it out there. But I want you, if you will, to invite as many people as you can who do not attend church to come. The truth of this is that it is now almost 11.30. I think I've been talking for about a half hour. And you will have wasted your time listening to me if you don't put into practice what I've shared today. That's true. Amen. And I will have wasted my time speaking. To you. I believe with all my heart that God is calling for a people, reluctant or not, fired up or not, he's calling for people to reach out with a message of salvation. You say, what will happen that day? It will be a good day, a wonderful day, and I will preach a message about salvation to give people an opportunity to 
respond to the gospel of Jesus Christ. If you ask them and you're praying between now and then, who knows? Maybe between now and then you'll actually bring somebody who already received Christ before that day. Wouldn't that be something? You've never led somebody to Christ, I can tell you this much. It's one of the greatest joys that you'll ever have in your life. You'll never regret it. And you'll always be glad that you did. And you'll do it again. So, close your eyes for just a moment. Think of some names. People who do not regularly attend church anywhere. You might want to think of a few enemies. Folks you never met. That's who the Samaritans were that Philip went to. Maybe some folks that are different color, different economic background. People you work with, friends, family. these cards today. We're going to have a problem with us taking all of them out today. We'll, we'll get more for next week. We're going to saturate this region with invitations to come. Lord, I pray right now that you will speak to the hearts of the people that are their hearts as they respond to an invitation to give an invitation I pray more that you will already have been preparing the way and opening the door I thank you for it in Jesus name Amen when you're ready to come you guys just spread out just a little bit come and get as many of those cards as you know you have names for that you give them to Lord, I 
pray for a miraculous harvest out of these seed. In the name of Jesus, I bless you to go forth and spread the gospel, to spread the invitation, to be anointed to win the lost, and to bring in the sheep into the fold. In the name of Jesus, I bless you to go out and change the world in which you live.